Neurotoxicology is an important science. It is the only science that examines the impact of environmental contaminants that act on the brain. And by acting on the brain, they can cause significant effects on what we do and how we navigate the world. Neurotoxicology draws from a number of other neurosciences and public health sciences, and in my case, behavior. Uh, and by studying behavior, we are, we are the translational science. We span the basic sciences of neurophysiology and neuroanatomy and so forth, and the epidemiology that tracks how these contaminants act on real people. We try to model these actions in our behavioral laboratory, and that's what we do here at Auburn with my students. In my particular area, we have studied mostly methylmercury. And methylmercury exemplifies a lot of areas of neurotoxicology. It is a highly potent contaminant. Its actions on the brain play out in behavior in important ways, but it is also a lifespan developmental neurotoxicant. We've known for a long time that the developing fetus is especially sensitive to methylmercury. The developing brain is very different than our brain. We can tolerate a great deal more of things like alcohol or other poisons or toxins, but when you're looking at a developing brain, it cannot tolerate very many changes. It's actually going through the stages of development. So it's important to know what are those levels, particularly when we're talking about something like methylmercury, which is found in fish, and we can accidentally consume pretty high quantities during pregnancy without realizing it. The biggest thing that we saw was when you get to the aging aspect, which is sort of a second insult to the system, we saw accelerated aging. So in this case, one of the major findings was prenatal exposure, didn't see a whole lot during adolescence necessarily, but when that aging occurred, we saw a very accelerated aging. My students and I have been especially interested in bringing the best of behavioral neuroscience and the best of behavior analysis to understand how these affect the brain and its function, and its function is expressed in behavior. We take special care and diligence in designing and tailoring and customizing what we do. We are very careful to establish stable baselines so that we can, that we can perturb with different kinds of challenges to understand how it is that methylmercury is acting. We looked at adolescence a lot because it's a very understudied developmental window. For children, often that's their first contact to weak exposures outside of what would occur during gestation. The goal of the lab was really to shed light on that unique sensitivity, both to methylmercury and to drug exposures. But it also led us down other paths of unique postnatal sensitivities, which is where some of my work came in, looking also at neonatal exposure. I came into a well-established lab that had already been looking into um, some of the mechanisms by which methylmercury would affect behavior and, and development in particular. And so one of the things we did was use nemotipine, a, a CCB, um, and we delivered it at, in addition to the mercury that the animals were receiving. And what we found was that uh, the calcium channel blocker, in an age-dependent manner, offset the methylmercury deficit. The CCB treatment was actually much less effective and suggested that methylmercury exposure uh, by age would be a really important factor here. Behavioral research is really important because ultimately you can have a ton of changes within the brain, but if they don't result in what we call a phenotype or a change in behavior, how much do we really care? And we know person to person, there are a lot of protein changes that don't always manifest into a phenotype or a behavioral change. So it's really important that we can detect those behavioral changes. And if done right, they can be very sensitive to even small changes in protein. I'm especially proud of contributing to the body of knowledge of what is a tolerable level of methylmercury for the developing fetus. And that, again, has impacts in terms of what we cover with things like WIC, um, because again, tuna used to be one of the only things that was covered by WIC. And some of our work helped change that so that there's a greater span of protein options that are covered. So I'm very proud to be able to influence actual human life by figuring out what is a tolerable level for a neonate. The time at Auburn really was a building block and really was this collaborative research experience where all of the students there really built ideas off of each other and one of the best mentoring experiences that I've had. As I became more involved in, the, in, in Dr. Newland's lab at Auburn, um, I became much, much more interested in neurotoxicology as a field. 
uh, environmental contaminants. It's kind of shaped my whole career, I would say. What I took away from Auburn has directly impacted, you know, the last 10 years uh, of my work since I left. The work that we saw um, of with methylmercury exposure accelerating aging, if we can prevent that from happening, we can have longer lives and more healthy and more productive lives and become less impaired as we get older. And every one of us with luck will get older. So it's important to know what these chemicals do, at what levels of exposure they do this, and how we can um, prevent this damage.